Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Alexander Schlemenko of giving up on the filthy casuals guide to Valentina Shevchenko. Jack Slack, it's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you following a low key weekend of fights. No Bellator, sort of shoddy one show, um, and a very low effort UFC show. It was Composers versus Haney, which I'll probably talk about on the boycast. Uh, and then I was expecting. Denaire versus Inoue, but that's in Japan, so they're doing it on a random Tuesday night. <laughs> so that's tomorrow. Um, in terms of news updates over the weekend, the fight, sorry, the match rather, uh, Tension versus Takeru, keeps getting worse. Keeps getting worse, this situation. I, I, li- I know I like making fun of things, but what I want more than anything is for these two to fight. <laughs> and I have for quite a while. Um, if you were here last week, Sakaki Bara, his involvement with the Yakuza has bombed the TV deal with Fuji TV, which means that they don't have anywhere to show the fight. And then uh, it came out that the Tokyo Dome, where the fight's supposed to be held, is booked under the name of Fuji TV. So they might have just lost the Tokyo Dome as well. Um, and then, the, yeah, there's this account, The Match 2022, that's like, we need to all retweet this message so that a TV company picks up the fight. Uh, and both Tension and Takeru have come out and said how massively disappointed they are in sort of like, why should I even fight type statements because nobody's going to see it. I just, it it's incredible to watch someone fumble the ball this hard on what should easily be a slam dunk. He says, confusing the metaphors between sports, but this should be the biggest fight of the, well, kickboxing, probably like the last 20 years. Um, Japanese combat sports, yeah, probably the last 20 years as well. I mean, it's, it's fucking huge. And uh, they're blowing it, son. So keep your eyes on that as it's developing because it's just... It, it's so funny, but it also makes me want to cry. <laughs> um, so yeah, this weekend... Sorry, last weekend's fights, uh, Rosenstruck versus Volkov. We'll start with the main event because I was pleasantly surprised. I know people think that I just love being right about fights being crap. And, you know, who doesn't love being right? I do love being right. But when it comes to fights being crap and then surprising me by being good, that's really nice. (laughs) It's it's really nice to be wrong about a fight being bad. It's really nice to be wrong and just learn new things about fighters, to be honest. But uh, Alexander Volkov came out in this one against a dangerous counterpuncher in Rosenstruck, and he set right to work. He set a a great pace out the gate, um, and he really... Like within the first 20 seconds, I think he landed five kicks or, or threw five good kicks against um, Rosenstruck's guard, which is not a fucking around pace. Because part of the, the thing with these Frozenstruck fights, I like that nickname. I, my favorite was um, someone called him <laughs> Doesn't Struck or Doesn't Strike the other day. Uh, that made me chuckle, but there's loads of them. But uh, the, the reason that he has fights like that is partly because he doesn't want to lead. And partly because people are scared of leading against him. You know, it's a two-person... Uh, it takes two to tango. It takes two to have a boring fucking fight. And Alexander Volkov was having none of it. He went out and he immediately started hitting with jabs and kicks. And we talked last week about um, the right front kick, which I've always liked about Volkov. One of my um, better Twitter moments was be- against Walt Harris. I said, right front kick should be a big deal for Volkov here. And then he immediately knocked him out with one <laughs> straight to the body. Um, but it's, it's been one of his best weapons for a long time. It can be hit and miss against orthodox opponents. One of the reasons that I liked against Harris was because Harris is a, a southpaw where Volkov's orthodox, um, and it just lines up better on that side where, you know, if, if the opponent is slightly bladed and you're throwing it, your right leg against an orthodox fighter, their elbow can get in the way and so on. But um, because Rosenstruck's lead, hand, lead elbow and hand are so often away from his body, um, he was actually pretty susceptible to it. He only landed it a few times, Volkov, but um, that's probably more to do with the fact that the fight was surprisingly short. Uh, it looked like it was going to be a bit of a hassle for Rosenstruck in the long run. Um, we talked about it specifically because I've not seen Rosenstruck enter off straight kicks very well, and I have seen him enter off round kicks extremely well. It's one of the things that I really like about him. Uh, there aren't many because he doesn't do much in a lot of these fights, but one of the things that I really like about him is when guys try to kick well and technically, he's really good at entering on them. I mean, it's how he caught um, the better kickboxers that he fought in the ring. He will 
especially left kicks above the waist. And one of the things that made this fight interesting was that Volkov was actually committing to those. Um, when I, you know, if I were advising someone fighting Rosenstruck, I'd just be like, never throw a left kick above his waist because he's really good at taking it on both forearms, using his left arm to parry it across his body and then swing that arm out wide as he drops the leg and leap in with a left hook and then a right straight afterwards. And that sequence played out a few times in this fight. The big flurry that he hit just before the finish, or the big flurry he went for just before the finish, he he got in and he left hook, he hit uh, Volkov with the left hook right in the face, and then tried to follow up on it with like four or five big swings. But it's a it's a great way to close, and he's super fast doing it. Um, and if you you know if you need to see another fight with that sort of thing in Masvidal versus Cerrone is a great example because Cerrone's always going to switch to high kick at some point in the fight, and uh, Masvidal just kept pressuring him until he did. And uh, caught the kicks, parried it across his across his body, and came in with the left hook, knocked him down twice with the same uh, same counter. You come in with the left hook and the right hand afterwards. You know it's not um, just the left hook. But the reason that uh, parrying kicks across your body is so useful is that you're basically giving yourself a dominant angle. If you walked around to the to your right until you were coming in from the opponent's side, that's the sort of advantage you're giving yourself by throwing their left leg off to your left. There's a bit of danger because if you're not careful with it, you can throw them into a back fist. There are some very um, savvy fighters who will use it to go into a back fist or a back elbow. But generally, um, it's one of those ones where it's, it's it's just a really dominant position. If you if you can get the guy kicking into your blocks and parry them, um, it, it's really powerful. Problem is that at, at high levels against good kickers, guys uh, are more, you know, they absorb the kick and they can't capitalize on it because a good kick on the arms will still knock you off balance. And a good kick on your arms will actually freeze up your arms for a moment afterwards. You know, that's one of the things that um, a lot of top ties do in open guard matchups. They'll kick the rear arm just to keep it at home. Can't punch when you're getting kicked in the arm. But yes, it was interesting that Volkov was going to round kicks to the um, body and head. Uh, his hand fighting was great in this one. His use of his reach was great in this one. Um, because Rosenstruck, the big left hook into the right hand is his counter. He, so that's how he sets it up off the... Round kick, he'll parry across and come in with it. Um, if you throw like a right low kick at him, he'll just step in on it. And uh, if you jab at him, he's going to parry with his lead, sorry, with his rear hand, his right hand. And he's going to reach out and parry, and he's going to lean back and throw the left hook and then come in with the right hand afterwards. So his left hand is always sort of floating away from his body, ready to swing into a big hook. And his right hand is often going forward at the first sign of a jab. And by um, hand fighting with him, as in putting both his hands on top of Rosenstruck's hands, Volkov was able to annoy him and then poke in jabs in between. And then uh, by getting those jabs established, he had Rosenstruck reaching for the jabs really quite um, severely. Rosenstruck, sorry, uh, Volkov actually went to a body jab a couple of times, which is cool to see from a guy who's like almost seven feet tall committing to the body jab against a guy who's about 6'2". Uh, Rosenstruck's listed as 6'4 or something, but he fought... Um, Cyril Garn, who's actually 6'4", and he just he was uh, like half a foot shorter than him. But the establishing of that jab, um, which he used really nicely, he was throwing, uh, he's hand fighting, then pumping the jab, and then stepping up into an inside low kick uh, from quite a short range. Because the inside low kick can be a, a nice step-up weapon from way outside. It can be a point scorer like Alexander Volkanovsky uses it as. Um, but Volkov here was using it to really chop in good kicks from almost on top of the guy, which I think he's got like a Sado Kekan karate background or something like that, which is, you know, much more how you'd see it in that sport rather than um, kickboxing and Muay Thai. It's a very close-range weapon for them. But ha having established that jab, the finish of this fight comes as Rosenstruck ended on the counter off the left kick, swung a few times, stopped, looked like he got a little bit tired already, but uh, Volkov immediately turned him onto the fence, which was lovely Ringcraft, on a card where Ringcraft was uh, a letdown for a few guys. Um, Volkov turned him onto the fence and it put him under pressure, got close enough where... This is one of the things, like, the, the fence can be useful. You can pressure people to it and then take it. I mean, it's always going to be useful, but a lot of people don't step in close enough to take advantage of it because what you've done is you've taken away their retreat. So you step in close enough that they don't have time to react to your jab. Just step in close enough so that if you jab, it's on their nose already. Um, it's, you know, you have to put yourself in danger a bit. Less so if you're gigantic and have three or four inches of reach on them already. But um, it was good to see him get close enough for that. And what he did was he... Uh, shoulder faked really well, shoulder fainted. He dropped his level slightly and he shrugged his left shoulder towards uh, Rosenstruck. And you can see this in the slow-mo replay, it's fantastic. Um, I included it in my article, my slacky secret post-fight notes. Uh, 
you know, you can see it very clearly in stills too, but I highly recommend watching the replay again because he, he just drops his level, shrugs his shoulder, and uh, Rosenstruck reaches way out in front of him with his right hand, square, completely square, trying to lean back, and the, there's just the fence behind him. And uh, Volkov goes faint right straight, straight down the middle, and uh, and it hurts him and gets the stoppage. Um, much argument over the stoppage. I think it was just... You know, Herb Dean's in a constant cycle of too early and too late. So <laughs> it's just standard Herb Dean. Um, not his most annoying thing. His most annoying thing is running straight up to a guy with his arms waving in the air and then stopping an inch short of touching them so that the guy thinks the fight's being stopped and then has to get back and start hitting the guy on the floor again. But the left fake to the right straight, beautiful little technique. So much more effective when you put a guy to the fence or the ropes because... Um, he has to respect the feint. He can't just back off slightly. You know, you're using that feint to cover the distance to put you close enough to throw the right hand, and the timing isn't the same as a one-two. It's more like one-two. You know, it's it's straight there, and he doesn't have time to react. Putting people to the fe- to the fence or the ropes and standing close enough eats up the the buffer zone that they use to read things. You know, the, and a very extreme example of this would be someone like Leo de Machida, who has a ten foot gap between his opponent him and his opponent, to read things. You know, he spends the first round just watching them come in. Because there's only so many ways that a guy will feel comfortable charging over the distance. But, uh, sorry, we talk about Machida, and we don't need to. It's not a Machida um, episode. I just always love talking about Machida. So, yeah, I thought a really impressive performance from Volkov. Made a great statement, because I think he was on a two or three fight streak of losses now, wasn't he? And he, he got absolutely handled by Tom Aspinall. And you had to think, well, certainly I was thinking at the time, like, this is Volkov on the way down. Because I... I you just don't see him getting manhandled by that. Uh, and it, yeah, I was very impressed by Tom Aspinall's performance in that. But I did think that it was a convergence of those two things. Um, this gives me you know, even more faith in Tom Aspinall, to be honest. But um, really great performance from Volkov. And he came at it like he knew he had to get down to business. And, you know, in the process, he pulled a fun fight out of Rosenstruck. You know, he, he gave Rosenstruck a really hard time. I, you know, I, I think by focusing on those cool counters that I talked about, the, the, you know, the parry of the kick and come in off it, which I talked about before this fight, saying, oh, will he be able to get them off against a guy who mainly likes straight kicking? Um, and then focusing on his successful counters with those in this fight, I think I might have given the impression that he gave a better account of himself than he did. He had real trouble here. He was on the back foot from start to finish, and uh, his glimpses of uh, success were very few. So yeah, great little fight for the main event. And I think really one of my highlights of the card, because there wasn't an awful lot on this that uh, wowed me. The, <laughs> the things that I didn't talk about in my post-fight notes um, are Alonzo Manyfield versus... As, that's just... I'm going to... I've tweeted about this already, but it just... It sums up the state of these fucking cards that a guy with a 4-3 and three record for Odie Osborne, and guys, he, he got overlooked because the Ukrainian guy's fake record stole all the attention, but um, people were you know, praising Odie Osborne's amazing knockout in that fight where he knocked him out in one minute or something like that, um, but they didn't realise that the guy he fought had like no MMA experience uh, except losses, basically. Um, I think he was a glory fighter at some point, but this is MMA, and you've already lost three out of your seven fights. In fact, Tyson Nam knocked him out in the first round. So, you know, I think that might be the one where Tyson Nam just looked amazing. And it was basically because this guy was fighting him. I remember talking about that during the uh, the COVID times. I was saying, like, you know, they've got, they've got a USC, UFC vet versus late last-minute replacement. But he wasn't last-minute replacing here, which is really weird. Um, so, that, yeah, that's how desperate the cards are getting. But the other guy... Askar Mozorov, whose name has changed about three times this week. Um, truly strange story. And originally I thought this was like, oh, they're just desperate for a last minute replacement for Alonzo Manyfield, so they didn't check shit. But he's already been booked to fight in the UFC twice, once against Ben Rothwell at heavyweight, once against Dustin, uh, Dustin Jacoby. And those were a, a few months apart. So they know of this guy, and he, he had to re- withdraw both times. Um, so it's bizarre that they didn't know that his record is largely fraudulent. Now, I'm going to shout out my friend Jay Petrie at um, Sherdog for this. I think he's the editor there or the, or the managing editor or the, the boss. But he's a Fightland alum, so support him. Um, but he put together just this amazing record of Mozarov trying to change his record and just lie about things that he'd done. And 
it's one of the strangest stories that I've encountered this year. Uh, well, perhaps, you know, probably the last, yeah, ever in, in MMA. It's, I just don't get what the end goal was. Um, it's one of those things where I, I saw someone say it, but it's, it's just perfect. You're only cheating yourself. You know, you're like your teacher used to say, because what are you doing? You're lying about your record and inflating it to get a shot in the UFC, to get beaten by fighters who've actually done that. You know, it's, um, you're not going to show up on the night if you haven't been showing up on the nights before it, you know, because uh, he changed his name three times to try and discard losses on his record because he started his career with three losses back to back. And then he had another couple of streaks of losses in between. And he was sending um, notes to Sherdog and the and I presume to Tapology as well, actually. Be interesting to get their side of it because they're the two big record keeping sites. But he was sending letters to Sherdog claiming to be the promoter of um, Full Metal Dojo. And the f- promoter of Full Metal Dojo, I think, is John Nutt uh, of um, Fight Circus fame nowadays. But, you know, he's, he's just making up names of people who never worked there to say this fight didn't happen, you got it wrong. But then it got even more interesting because people were finding uh, videos of his wins and they're just, or at least look like people taking down. I, I, don't know, I don't know if I have to be careful with someone who's literally been proven to have lied about their record several times. But, you know, I, you always have to be careful with stuff like this, like whenever I'm talking about um, Haim Ghazali, I always leave the door open that maybe his opponent was just that bad and the standard of the fight was just that bad that they made terrible, terrible decisions that a day one beginner wouldn't. But I don't know if I have to do that here. These these fights, like, he comes out, he throws a high kick against the guy's guard and the guy covers up and the referee stops it. Just insane. But then... Like I said, what is the payoff of all that? The payoff of all that is that you get to the UFC and they booked you against Ben Rothwell, who probably would have murdered him. Dustin Jacoby, who probably, again, would have seriously hurt him. I mean, his his, his strength seems to be his stand-up. So Dustin Jacoby probably would have hurt him. Um, and then Alonzo Manyfield just battered him from top position, <laughs> which is uh, not what Manyfield's known for. But like he said, you know, it's his job. Uh, why would he not take the easiest path of victory? against someone like this. He also said, this guy's got three records, which I thought was great. Um, But I don't, I listen to, I mean, I watched the fight, but I skipped through all the stuff in between in the entrances. But I don't think the commentators even touched on this. And I would imagine, because it had been a big story, I would imagine they were told not to. So respect to Alonzo Manyfield for pointing it out. But yeah, mostly this was a grapple fucking by um, Manyfield, took him down. I mean, just looked like a guy who's been training mixed martial arts with the best, being among the best. Um, and, and training at the highest levels and competing at the highest levels against a guy who always wanted to but has been sort of pretending until now. Now, when he got back to his feet, you know, um, Mozarov actually looked pretty dangerous and he did the sort of like throw the arms out, come on, you know, throwing a, a high kick against the guard and stuff like that. But then he immediately got taken down and battered again. Um, and it was this guy, it was uh, Mozarov, Mozarov and uh, who was the other guy talking trash while being dominated from top position? Uh, sorry, do- dominated while they were on the bottom position on this card. Oh, it was Dan- Danny Argueta. <laughs> it's just to be like, another boring win. And you're like, learn to get up. That's, that's the solution there. Um, yeah, just wild. I mean, he didn't look bad on the feet, but everything about this guy just screams like pretend fighter. You know, all the neck... Ta- like, there was a big story this week about him, them asking him if he copied his tattoos from... Um, I said that weirdly, tattoos from uh, Conor McGregor, and he's just saying, no, they're my own tattoos, my own neck tattoo. Um, though, of course, Conor McGregor famously copied most of his from uh, some male model. But yeah, it's just super weird, because there was also, Mozarov was asked about it in the pre-fight press stuff, about his record, and he's like, oh, if, you know, I, I don't even care about my fights, I don't count them. You know, so, Obviously, when I got signed, some loser looked into it. But he's been sending emails to Sherdog pretending to be someone else to get his record changed. And he's changed his name three times to do it. So uh, it's just not a great look. But very funny. A very funny story. I want to congratulate Alonzo Manyfield, but he was so much better than this guy who shouldn't have been here. And honestly, it was just sort of, um, you know, I'll, I'll congratulate him for being a professional. Which I think is about the, the best praise you can give compared to someone like Mozarov. But there was a Pat Barry sighting. Was a 50. Yeah. <laughs> People begging me not to use the soundboard. They're like, Jack, please stop using the soundboard. I'm trying to use it when it's appropriate and when it'll make me laugh. Or at least maybe someone else. But mainly me.
So what else was good? Oh, let's talk about Mov- Movzar Evluev because I really liked his performance. Uh, again, I wrote about this one in the Slacky Secret Post Fight Notes, which if you're a Patreon boy, go over and check it out on the Fight Primer. Um, trying to do more post fight writing. Sometimes I get more time to do them than others. Sometimes I do more of the fights than others, but it's good to get back in the practice. Um, but yeah, Evluev fought Danny. Ige. I yeah, mixed opinions on. Well, I have <laughs> me. I'm scoring split decisions and having mixed opinions of Danny Ige. But in his last six fights, he's got like one decisive win, the one over Gavin Tucker, which was very impressive. But a lot of the time, he's getting split decision wins. He's losing. You know, it's just, um, it's interesting that he was ranked number 10, you know, after, in, in with like one decisive win in six fights. But um, that win over, quote unquote, win over Edson Barboza carried a lot of weight. But, you know, Danny, yeah, you're going to have a bad game plan which is weird because he works with Eric Nixick, and um, you're going to have this weird form of striking where one exchange doesn't ever carry into the next. And by that, I mean Danny Gay. I mean, try and find someone who looks at you like Danny Gay looks at running in on straight lines. Because what he does, like, he'll either, when he's, when he's trying to be slick and smart, he will double and triple jab. But that's all on a straight line. Uh, it's just covering, you know, he expects the opponent to give ground, so he just goes on a straight line. Um, or inevitably he will start leading with the right hand and shifting through. And we talk about this quite a lot, or we, you know, we used to have to talk about it quite a lot because of shifting generally being such a huge part of the MMA meta, particularly back in like the late 2000s. Guys were not shifting clever like Dustin Poirier. They were just shifting. Well, actually, you know, Dustin Poirier was shifting all the time, always. Uh, and then he learned to box and it got better. But uh, back then, just everyone was shifting all the time. And there's, we, we talk about this like shifting by choice and sh- shifting by necessity. If you throw a big right hand and you lean your head over your front foot to the point that your head is way out in front of your hips and your back foot is up on the ball of that foot, you have to step. You know, it's going to take a lot of effort to sway back the other way because all your weight's going forward. And what Dan Ige did throughout this fight was have to step every time he threw the right hand. So he charged through in these big, like, two-punch uh, shifting combinations, cover the whole distance of the cage from his back on the fence to... Evloev's back on the fence, and then he would let Evloev circle out at the end of the exchange because every every exchange did nothing to help the next. So he'd do a big charge across the cage, not quite get him at the fence, and then he'd go, okay, well, now it's your turn. And Evloev would throw something, and Danny Gay would back off. And then Danny Gay would go, okay, it's my turn again. You know, nothing leads into anything else. It's really weird to watch. Um, you know, I don't want to say sparring match because they were taking lumps out of each other and he got seriously beaten up. But you know what I mean when I say... Well, yeah, it's like it was kind of like full contact Dutch drilling. They were just going tit for tat, taking turns. And that was by Danny Gay's choice, you know. Um, but that throwing yourself forward with the right hand and sh- having to shift through walked him onto two brutal intercepting knees. Uh, and there were loads of great uh, occasions where he went, he just charged in like galloping footwork. So left foot, right foot up to left, left foot out again, you know, a triple step thrusting in with a big jab. And he goes straight past Evluev as Evluev clips him with the right hand and circles off. Just the constant straight lines and never pressuring him towards the fence and then taking advantage of it. Really weird, because I know that Nick Sick's a good coach. I know he's been working with Nick Sick for ages. So I don't know why he still has this bizarre fighting style. You know, against Edson Barbosa, a guy who will lose automatically if you put him to the fence. Danny Gay's running in with combinations and then stepping out the side door. And you're like, why are you stepping out the side door? against a guy who's just going to go straight back. If it sounds harsh, it's because I, I believe he has a lot of physical talent and uh, mechanical talent. You know, he's got good punches, good um, slips and counters when he, when he uses them, but he's fighting in ways that just aren't tactically at all smart. Meanwhile, Evloev, I thought looked really good because I, I said in my um, post-fight notes, but uh, a few months back, I would not have given him much... Um, you know, I wouldn't have expected him to get past Ige on the feet without getting flustered and then you know, hit with things while being flustered. Uh, his his striking, while it was very measured and he didn't show an awful lot um, of a variety or combinations or anything like that, he did look comfortable and kept himself safe. And that's all you can ask for for a guy whose main strength is his grappling. When he did get on Dan Ige, um, you know, he gave him a really hard time. Ige was good at standing up and stuff, but he, he had the body lock for most of that first round. Um, or everywhere I've had the body lock for most of that first round. Yeah, it was just sort of like a coming-of-age performance from, uh, for Mozvar, Movzar Evluev, who I've been sort of hot on for a little while, but he's been getting, like, decisions over not amazing fighters in the division, um, in the, you know, the relatively in the UFC featherweight division. 
Um, but yeah, he just did it. You know, it, it could be one of those ones where he looks better against better competition. He just rises to the level of competition. Certainly, he seems to be improving, and that's the important point. Whereas I think Danny, again, I said this in my post-fight notes again, but I think he's taking on the Jeremy Stevens role in the Jeremy Stevens division, which is enormously physically talented. Uh, and if you're a good fighter, or a great fighter even, you'll still have to fight clever to beat him. But he seems to have sort of stagnated in his game. Damon Jackson versus Daniel Argueta was uh, one of those troublesome fights where you're like, yeah, it is boring. But also, I respect it, but also it is boring. Um, it's just, he was on his back for the whole fight, not really landing punches. I think this is one of the things that kind of hacks me off in fighting at the moment. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I am a person who, while grappling with people, loves getting on their back and just recycling their hands and going for chokes over and over again. But you have to be able to come up on top. You know, that's something that even Shinny Aoki could do. Uh, he'd be on the back for ages. He'd either do a body triangle with one foot inside on the um, butterfly hook and come up that way, flattening someone to one arm. It's sort of like a very early version of the Dagestani handcuff. Um, or, I mean, um, Rafael dos Anjos. No, sorry, not Rafael dos Anjos. Rafael, Rafael Lovato was very good at this. Um, did it against uh, Musassi, of all people. But using the, back, the body triangle on the back or, or the, just your hooks on the back to come up into a top position on the back. Um, the whole problem with being on the back in MMA is that if you're on the back and underneath the guy, you're not going to be able to strike him effectively. Um, you're going to have trouble shooting your, your hands through for chokes because that's all you're doing. There's nothing to distract him. And you've got big gloves on, so he's going to grab him. And by grab, I mean in the legal way, where grabbing the wrist um, and the gloves will stop your hands slipping through. If you're doing like no gi jiu-jitsu, um, whenever someone grabs your hands you just pull your, your hand back over their shoulder and it slips out because it's just a sweaty bag of bones. Um, if you're wearing big gloves on your hands, it's a lot harder. So Damon Jackson had Daniel Argueta's back for a lot of the fight. Daniel Argueta suffered no punishment, was, wasn't really in danger of getting choked at a lot of points. And um, then at certain points, he'd just turn over back into Damon Jackson's closed guard because when you're on the bottom from the back, if you lose the hands or if he throws the hand over your head and turns back into you, you're on the bottom again, in closed guard. And that's true of everyone. The famous example is Tim Kennedy did it to Roger Gracie. Roger Gracie, who was unstoppable when he was on people's backs in ADCC or Jiu-Jitsu. There was a cool moment in this one, though, where they were sort of both sitting up with Damon Jackson on Argueta's back. And Argueta um, did the sort of answer the phone, so high elbow, getting away from the uh, rear naked choke and, and sitting, crunching up, sitting up so that he's separated his back from Damon Jackson's chest. And that's something that, I um, can't remember who it was, Rafael Domingo or someone like that, did it very successfully against Nicky Ryan, uh, Gordon Ryan's little brother. But uh, Damon Jackson just lined up the hole in, this guy, in the crook of this guy's elbow and physically punched his hand through straight and then got to the neck. And he, that was the closest he came to getting the choke in the fight. But... Um, yeah, pe people who like getting on the back really need to learn to get on top of it. And the thing is that you can you can change the back position into that quarter, uh, three-quarter mount and Dagestani handcuff position. You can go backwards into that. And it's not even backwards because then you're getting into a, a good striking position on top. But you have to like have the transitions to do that. And it is, you, you're going to have to hand fight your way there too. You know? you can't, there are things that you can't do on one side that you can do on the other side because it's an asymmetrical position one hands over the top but yeah frustrating fight and i can understand why danny argueta was arguing with uh damon jackson's corner and crying about it being boring but also i can understand why damon jackson wouldn't want to stay standing and get beat up because he, he took some serious lumps in the moments that this fight was standing what else was fun um kareen silver's uh dash choke against pollyanna botelio Kind of sad because Pollyanna Botelio was looking pretty good up until that point. She looked like she had a good read on Silver. Got a little bit too comfortable. Silver lunged in with an overhand and fell into the takedown and then just smashed her until she gave up the dars, basically. But we always like a dars choke finish. And we always like a woman who gets finishes. Um, this was her first in the UFC, but she got a guillotine on the Contender Series. Nice to have around in that awful, awful flyweight division. Odie Osborne's hands look sharp against... Um, a glory champion, as they uh, as they introduced him. So yeah, well done to him. Um, 
Oh, Gravely versus Munoz Jr. was the fight of the night. That was great fun. Um, one of those fights that was made better by both of them having sort of the same defensive floor. Uh, I think it was Munoz dropped Gravely with a left a counter left hook in the first round, and then Gravely dropped him with a counter left hook for the finish. Um, they were just yeah, it, it was great. Um, counter left hooks. I've been saying for a while they're going to be huge. Um, not quite as huge as they are in karate combat at the moment, <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, they're they're a terrific weapon, and the more people start shortening them up, these two were still throwing them quite wide, um, and it was just more the guy getting caught coming in than a, a perfect counter left hook that's just closing the door constantly. And on the subject of uh, closing the door, fucking uh, Karolina Kowalkovic, if you are a simp, and I am to a degree a Karolina Kowalkovic simp, um, turn away now because this might upset you. But I was really happy to see her get the win. Um, I run into interviews with her talking about her depression and uh, suicidal thoughts and things like that. And that really does make you um, root for someone. And it was nice, you know, just, uh, her very genuine reaction after the win. And I, it is good that she got away from being coached by her husband and, and took it seriously. I think she went to ATT to train with uh, Joanna and, and so on. Um, so that's really good. Um, and the good stuff was still good. It's just that the bad stuff is still bad. She has one of the few legit right hands in women's MMA at that division, at, you know, at straw weight. Um, an absolute bomb of a right hand. She throws it really nicely. Her mechanics are lovely. You can see there's weight in it every time she goes in for it. But she also has this thing where she panics and tries to throw the right hand again as soon as possible. So she goes jab, right straight, and then she like either half jabs or just tries to pump the right straight again, you know, just to get back to the right hand again as soon as possible. And her feet are rooted and she's square the whole time she does it. So the the place where she got knocked out by... um. Jessica Andrade, that was where it happened. And it also, it doesn't help that she closes her eyes during exchanges, which is something that no top fighter should really be doing. Um, but great in the clinch with knees. Did lovely work here because she destroyed Rose Namajunas in the clinches. Um, Rose Namajunas battered her out in the open on the feet because Kowalkovich is pretty slow and really just the one-two is the, is the threat. Um, but every time that they... Every time that Rose lingered in the in the pocket, Carolina just grabbed her head and started kneeing her. Really gassed her out quickly with knees to the body. But that was like her best performance. She's not really done anything since then. This was her first win in five years. And <laughs> you're like, yes. And then you realize that it's also the the uh, the last win that she had was over Felice Herrig as well. So, I mean, at least she got the, the finish this time around. Um, meanwhile, Felice Herrig, again, herself hasn't lost, hasn't won in like four fights. Um, yeah, it was a really weird comparison of women's MMA striking faults in this one because Herrick was also doing the shifting with her head, her chin way up in the air. Um, yeah, you know, not a great fight, but a good story at least. It examined it in my Slacky's notes and said some things that, you know, if you were trying to fix Carolina and, and make... Because she's got real assets that you can use, like the great clinch work, the lovely knees, the really powerful right hand. Decent jab in this fight, actually. Better than I'd seen in the past. But to really make use of those, you have to cut down on the time in the middle where she's thrown her right hand and then she's trying to throw another right hand. And that's when she's always getting clipped, even by Herrig, by Andrade, by everyone. You know, um, Joanna beat her by, basically by combination punching and Carolina only being good for the first punch in the combination. But again, go read the post-fight notes for more of that. Erin Blanchfield, everyone's sort of hot on as the new prospect. Um, yeah. Ooh, losing concentration there. Um, she was very sloppy on the feet, loading up lots. JJ Eldridge kept getting free shots on her hips and then not converting them and instead coming up and getting head and arms thrown. So it was uh, women's MMA in a nutshell, but there was a really nice guillotine choke for the finish. So yeah, Blanchard needs some, needs some work on the stand-up um, to just, just stop loading up from a day's march away. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, she's all right. And did Jeff Mol Molina versus Zumag Zumalov sorry, Z Zalgas Zumagalov. Um, yeah, decent enough fight. Back and forth. A lot of people felt angry about the decision. The only real thing that's of note is that Jeff Molitor wore the Pride shorts, not Pride FC as in gay pride. Um, and they didn't look any different. It's, it's just your name in rainbow colours, but it means that your name isn't visible on the shorts. <laughs> so It's the absolute minimum the UFC could do. Someone pointed this out on Twitter. Absolute minimum they can do, but still enough to trigger bigots. Just fantastic. Some bantamweight from, um, or flyweight from Bellator was in the replies to this story, to just Jeff Molina being like, I was surprised that people were upset by it. It's not really a big deal. Um, 
And he, he replied, like, crying for attention. And then you immediately check his, his uh, bio. And there's Bible quotes in there. And you're like, oh, for fuck's sake. But then, you know, crying for attention, Bellator fighters, all they be doing is talking about UFC fighters. Anyway, that's that from this weekend. Um, there was some stuff on one, but I'll talk about that on the boycast. We finally got some fights coming up next weekend. Glover versus Jiri, you know, the return of Jiri, fantastic. Valentina Shevchenko is fighting, you know, the real Queen's Jubilee. Not that parade for serfdom that we had in London yesterday. Wei Zhang versus Joanna and Jacek rematch, great. Manel Cape versus Ruggiero Bontoring, great. Jack Della Madalena, my boy. Brendan Allen, fun enough. Andre Fialio. Yeah, that's looking like a pretty solid card, to be honest. So I'll talk about that on the boycast, and I will get excited about it. If the intro didn't tip you off, I am not finishing this Filthy Casuals Guide to Valentina Shevchenko, at least not imminently. Um, it is really... I'm not joking. I'm not doing a bit. It's really boring harvesting material from her fights because she's very good defensively, but she's so fucking skittish. And she spends minutes to set up these spinning counters that don't come anywhere close. But anyway, if you want to read my post-fight notes and all the other stuff we do, including the Advanced Striking 2.0 and the and listen to the boycasts, uh, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. And if you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Starting the process of braiding up my war hair for Jiri on Saturday. Bless. <laughs>